The good news is all the metals, all the key metals, gold, silver, platinum, even palladium, even nickel and things like that, they all still have very bullish constructive fundamental and technical factors that strongly suggest we're not anywhere need, near the ultimate top in this. In the world of finance, few voices carry as much weight as Peter Grandich's. With over 40 years of experience in the industry, Grandich has seen trends come and go, but one constant remains the allure of precious metals. In a recent video, Grandich shared his expert insights into the shifting dynamics of the gold and silver markets, shedding light on emerging trends and the factors driving them. Join us as we delve into Grandich's analysis and uncover what lies ahead for precious metals investors. Peter Grandich opens the discussion with a reflection on the evolving perception of silver. Long considered the underdog to gold, silver has recently gained momentum, spurred by shifting fundamentals that demand attention. Grandich notes a convergence of factors driving this newfound interest, highlighting silver's potential to rival gold as a premier investment option. However, Grandich emphasizes that the landscape of precious metals investment has evolved significantly since his early days in the industry. Traditional metrics and ratios may no longer hold the same weight in today's dynamic market environment. Yet, despite these changes, Grandich remains bullish on all key metals, including gold, silver, platinum, and even palladium. A key driver of this optimism is geopolitical uncertainty, with Grandich pointing to escalating tensions between global superpowers. As geopolitical risks mount, investors seek refuge in tangible assets like gold, a trend particularly pronounced in regions such as China, where retail demand for gold has surged. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. Let's get right into the latest interview with Peter Grandich as he gives us his gold and silver prices prediction. What's interesting about that, Elijah, is that for quite a while, I was never really loved by the silver bucks because I always put it in second place. But thankfully, a couple months ago, I saw a change in the fundamentals that made it warrant at least the same billion as gold. And we're seeing it you know, more than catch up now. <clears throat> and all of them are, are in a tight race. There's no one outstanding metal, even a metal that it's hard to imagine for somebody that was very involved in metals 20, 30 years ago. There was a time when platinum always had a premium over gold. Even platinum, which has lagged tremendously, is starting to see interest because people are waking up to the fact that metals need to be part of investment portfolios. But I think one of the things, if I can put an asterisk there, we are in such different times now than it existed 20, 30, 40 years ago. The market has nothing in common when I first put my hat on 40 years ago. So ratios that worked 40 or 30 years ago may not be as effective or as useful now because so many things have changed to make up what's happening with those things that make up the ratio. It's the same as I try to tell the people like me with gray hair or no hair, you know, 60s, 70s, that playing the market 40 years ago, the stock market is nothing like what it once was. You know, when I started, Elijah, 90% of the trading was individuals. I don't think individuals make up 10% of the trading now. So same thing with the ratio, but the good news is all the metals, all the key metals, gold, silver, platinum, even palladium, even nickel and things like that, they all still have very bullish constructive fundamental and technical factors that strongly suggest we're not anywhere need, near the ultimate top in this. Well, I just think the Russian, you know, you can say they were enemies or still enemies, but your enemy of your enemy is your friend. And I, I think that's at least as Russia and China looks at it and the U.S. is uh, person out. I, I, I don't want to get into this. It's always been, and there's a few people that will spend all day on it talking about does the United States still have all the gold that it's had and so forth and so on. Whether it does or doesn't, American citizens don't look at gold the same as we're seeing right now in China. Listen, one of the big things that's also driving China's accumulation is retail investors. Retail investors who might have otherwise had been counted on their savings or real estate in China have just overrun the physical demand. That's why there's such a premium uh, over there versus here. 
And uh, obviously, they're not there for a trade either. This is this is second nature to them. Americans are still paper. You know, let's take a flyer. The markets can never fail. The Fed just steps in and we're all live happily ever after. But I think the people that are accumulating the gold not only see the world problems, but they see more and more problems in the U.S. I mean, it's getting kind of listen. I don't normally get involved in politics, but I think this warrants it because of the topic we're talking about. If I'm sitting somewhere outside the United States and I'm watching this president now who's getting to the point where every sentence or two he says is misguided, misquoted, doesn't know where he's walking, doesn't know where he's talking. And then when I look what's in the bullpen, meaning who would replace him right now if something happened, I think I would want to own some gold, too. I mean, it's really, really concerning. And that's not because I'm a Trumpster. Everybody thinks as soon as you say that, it's because you want to see Trump win. I'm just looking at what we have to deal with. And I think quietly behind the scenes, especially how now, how we saw we double faced ourselves with Israel, that if you're a so-called ally of the United States, you have to ask yourself, <laughs> Are we next? Are, are we the next to be thrown under the bus? How we left Afghanistan, how we said one way one day about Israel, the next day we're saying this and all. It, it, it's very, very, I think the G, this is the best way to put it. Up until a couple of years ago, the financial service industry in the United States, especially those without the gray hair or no hair, paid little regard to geopolitics. They didn't think it had or will have any impact on the financial arena. That is clearly not the case and is going to play more of a more of an impact on us. And again, I'll just point out to the fact that more and more countries around the world are looking to move away from the United States and the US dollar and everything that we say and do is not a bullish factor for US markets if you're someone that still invests for years and not hours, days and weeks. Grandich doesn't shy away from addressing the elephant in the room, the role of politics in shaping investor sentiment. He candidly discusses concerns surrounding the current political landscape in the United States, underscoring the impact of leadership decisions on financial markets. This candid assessment underscores the interconnectedness of politics and finance, a relationship increasingly influencing investment decisions. Moreover, Grandich emphasizes the ongoing process of de-dollarization, wherein countries seek to reduce reliance on the US dollar as the global reserve currency. This paradigm shift carries profound implications for the future of currency markets, amplifying the appeal of precious metals as a store of value. Its value versus other currency has been basically about the same. But what has continued is less and less usage worldwide as the reserve currency continues. And, you know, this this thing about uh, de-dollarization and the, the talk about it is it's happening every day. It's not just fly by night. And the, we, we know that the BRICS are again meeting this fall. There's more and more talk that there's be a lot more involvement of countries. And I think we're going to learn some more about how they plan on doing all this, whether it's everything that's going to come out, probably not. But all these things play into a role of why the physical market, and, and that's another important point we talked about at the onset, and let's not lose sight of it. It's not a coincidence that when the paper market moved out of London and New York as the only places and dominated uh, the value put on gold each day and moved to the east, especially Shanghai, that has also led to less raids or whatever people want to term it all. And in the last couple of weeks, because you watch it closely like I do intraday, we saw moves where it would suddenly fall 20 or $30. And in the old days, not only would that go, but it would go lower and it would take days or weeks to rebound. It rebounded in a few minutes. If I'm one of those shorters, if they still exist out there and if they're still able to breathe because they've been crushed that they stayed in this, I'm thinking maybe the time has passed. It may be for something for me to look some other place because I don't think they have the influence that they have anymore. And that is another key factor because you and I 
knew for a lot of years, you've been in the business, your family, uh, Miles Franklin been around a long time. We saw when paper markets were getting crushed, people were just, can I get more gold? It didn't match what was happening. And that was an important part to take out because that's been a fear of some people. Oh, I don't want to get, because they always come and hammer it. And there's still going to be people saying that. But we're seeing that even when they try now, they just don't have the effect that they once had. A notable trend highlighted by Grandich is the geographical shift in gold trading, with a significant portion of market activity now concentrated in the East, particularly Shanghai. This shift has diminished the influence of traditional market manipulators, empowering individual investors and fostering a more transparent trading environment. In light of these developments, Grandich advises investors to adopt a long-term perspective recognizing the enduring value of precious metals amidst market fluctuations. He dispels concerns surrounding short-term volatility, urging investors to focus on the fundamental drivers underpinning the bull market in gold and silver. Well, your counterpound in China would be saying the opposite. They can't keep it in stock, and that's the reason. Okay, and now you have to ask yourself, who's going to end up being the smarter person, the person in China or the retail person here? That's the, that answer is yet to be seen. But I would tell you that with all the things that you and I discuss and other things we can, the more likelihood is the next thousand dollar move in gold. And I'm not saying it's going to 3,500, but I think gold had more of a chance of being 3,500 than it does have to be in 1,500 again. And so if people are selling, and don't get me wrong, I have people that bought gold as low as 12 or 1,300. And when it got to 2,400 and all, I said, listen, there's nothing wrong with taking five up to 25%. The good news for them is it was, hey, listen, take it and put it in copper. And some that did it, they're retiring now. Of course, I didn't do it. I don't follow my own advice, but people that did, did very, very well. So it's okay. You know, I know that people saying, well, this, this is very suspicious. Why aren't the gold funds and all? Well, listen, that's all part of how people miss major bull markets and eventually cave in at the end. Quite frankly, because it's been this way, Elijah, I would start to get nervous if you were telling me here, Pete, in the last two weeks, they're knocking. I can't even wake up there outside knocking on the door wanting to get some. We'd be closer to the end of the move. So I'm not concerned about U.S. or North American based. I'd be very concerned if we start to see a significant drop off out of Asia and China for physical bullion, which hasn't Right.